Good morning. I am Mr. Ish. You are joining me for this very interesting and important video, the Euler's formula. We're looking here at a very quick basic application of this at a basic level, but the main importance of this video is the derivation of that Euler's formula. What exactly is the Euler's formula? You can present it as this e to the power of i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Where you have the theta, you can easily replace it with the x. It doesn't matter. Either way is fine. And this formula, the Euler's formula, shows very well the interconversion between a complex number form, you know, z is always equal to x plus yi, which can be converted into this right here, the polar form or the trigonometric form, and then there's an interconversion between the two. This right here is the Euler's formula. I prefer right here to use the x's versus the thetas simply because I'm used to it. Let's look at some very quick basic application before we get into the more interesting part, the derivation of this formula. Anything which looks in this form can very well be converted into that form and a good example could very well be this and I'll put it out for you then we'll solve it out. You see here we have e, the exponential base e to the power of i pi over 3. You can very well convert it into this form by just doing cosine pi over 3 plus i sine pi over 3. And you know when you were to solve this using the trigonometric ratios, you know a 30, 60, 90 triangle, right? You have that. You got 1, 2, root 3, cosine pi over 3, with cosine pi over 3 being cosine of 60 is equal to 1 over 2, plus i, and sine 60 is root 3 over 2, and this right here is this form presented in this form, which of course is the complex form of this number, whatever it might be. Let's just look here at a very other quick question. e, we have i, e to the power of i, 5 pi over 6. You can separate it using this formula as cosine. 5 pi over 6 plus i sine 5 pi over 6. You know, 5 pi over 6 is one of those 30 degree angles, but in the second quadrant, it'll be 150 degrees. And you know, cosine is always negative over there. And you know, you're looking here at a 30 degree reference angle in the second quadrant, right? You're looking here at a 1. Here you're looking at a minus root 3 and 2. And this, with regards to this representation of 150, would be minus root 3 over 2 plus i over 2 because sine of 150 is the same as sine of 30 which is 1 over 2 and there it is the representation. Let this be the last basic application we look at because the main focus of this video is derivation. In another video we can look at more applications of this Euler's formula but I want to get into the derivation procedure because that is the more important part. But let this be the last one and I promise you this right here is actually very interesting and it might be very familiar to you. If you open this up using the Euler's formula, you're looking at cosine pi and then you're looking at i sine pi. You know, in terms of pi, cosine is always equal to a minus 1 and in terms of sine, that's equal to 0, you'll get plus 0i which is equal to a minus 1. So we end up seeing that this right here is equal to that. You can rewrite it out e to the i pi or pi i, it doesn't matter how you write that part is equal to minus 1. Bring the minus 1 onto the other side. You have e to the i pi plus 1 is equal to 0. And here you have that famous equation of mathematics which shows the five different items or the five different numbers. You have a 0, you have a 1, you have a pi, an imaginary number, and e. You have here several different types of numbers. You got a whole number, you have a natural number, irrational number, irrational number, and here you have an imaginary number and some of these numbers are also at the same time are rational numbers and some of these are at the same time real numbers. So you have a whole bunch of different types of numbers in this one equation. And this right here is one of the most famous equations of mathematics because you have e, i, pi, 1 and 0 represented in one equation. And now you've seen where it comes from. It comes from the Euler's formula application of this right over here. Let's next get into the derivation of this formula over here. Now the derivation of this Euler's formula will consume the remainder of this video and we're going to do it for you. There are a variety of perspectives but since we're looking here at calculus videos we'll use a calculus perspective. Remember we're not proving it, we're deriving this formula for you. The procedure starts with you making two assumptions that there are two functions. One function represents this item here, the other function represents that and we can numerically quantify these functions. One is f1 number 1 is equal to e i x, e to the power of i x. The other function f2 is equal to everything else you see over there, cosine x plus i sine x. Some form of commonality will appear and that's the route you want to take with this. If you take the derivative of each of these, 
you know you're doing the derivative here of the f1 function which is e to the i x you can do this and you can use a chain rule when you do this you know you get d over du e to the u and then du or dx i x here the x will go away i will retain you'll have i e to the u which is i e to the power of i x and you're seeing that that right there is a derivative of the f1 function let's do the derivative of the f2 function which is that expression cosine x plus i sine x when you do this it's polynomial except the polynomials here are in trigonometric form you'll have minus sine x plus i cosine x that right there is the derivative of this f2 function remember here's my f1 here's my f2 we've split that Euler's formula into two separate functions we're looking at them piece by piece manner when you look at this a trend or a commonality appears there's no difference between this and this your derivative and your original remember this right here is my derivative of f1 this right here is my derivative of f2 when you look at the derivative of f1 and you compare it to the original function there's no difference other than there's a presence of an i all of this can be very well represented as i and then you're looking at that your function f1 with an i placed to it represents your derivative of function f1 likewise over here if you were to take your f two function and just hit everything here with an i you'll see you'll end up exactly with the derivative of what you're seeing right here you'll have an i cosine x and then you'll have a i square sine x which becomes right here a minus sine x so all of this is equal to the f2 function with an i before it and that's exactly what it is and there it is the derivatives have been taken and the commonality has manifested what is the commonality over here the commonality is this in each case the derivative is always equal to let's just say right here without any designation of one or two the derivative of any function here f1 or f2 is always equal to the original function right but we have an i before it and you know here everything is with regards to x so that's our commonality that the derivative of any of these original functions f1 or f2 is always equal to that original function f1 or f2 but with an i placed before it and that's a commonality which will help push everything forward now we have made several assumptions when we did this derivation procedure when we did this derivation procedures we did make some assumptions one was that everything here with regards to this representation is differentiable all these inherent equations were defined like sine x was defined i sine x was defined cosine x was defined all of these values here x in terms of real numbers were defined the i here in terms of imagining number was defined the z the complex number was defined or the set of complex numbers x was defined or the set of all real numbers once we made those assumptions it allowed us to go down this path but now we've gone down this path and we've determined the derivatives of these f1 and f2 what we need to do is now apply f1 and f2 in a some form of a format such that when we do that we can come up with a good meaningful result a good format we can appreciate and apply is the quotient of f1 and f2 the reason why we can do that is not very difficult it's rather clear when you put it into this format right over here you're essentially saying you're doing the f1 function you're you're doing the e to the i x or you're doing cosine x plus i sine x if you look at this expression over here it's really nothing more than a unit circle and when you plot the points on that unit circle everything is always defined in terms of these values you have in this expression there's nothing in there which is undefined so when you put this entire expression we have so far into a quotient form you very well create a depiction of what we're trying to do here in a in a means that it is defined in the form of a unit circle such that everything here will be defined so when we're doing everything here in a form of a quotient f1 divided by f2 it would make sense that we continue with this derivation procedure and you would have to bring in the quotient rule over here you know when you're doing the quotient rule it's nothing more than the f2 function times the derivative of the f function f1 function minus the f1 function times the derivative of the f2 function divided by the f2 function squared right it's nothing more than that now since you've done this little route over here you have these values f2 f1 the derivatives of each all you have to do is plug them in we know the f2 value is this right here so what we can do here because of the space we can just bring everything here f2 is cosine x plus i sine x and i know that just by looking right over here the derivative of the f1 function is this which is i e to the power of i x then we have this minus sign right the f1 function here is right here e to the power of i x and then the f2 derivative is all of this right over here minus sine x 
plus i cosine x. Remember, this is us putting everything here into this quotient of these two functions to come up with even more of a meaningful result. And then f2 function is right over here, squared. You can do cosine x plus i sine x squared. Now due to space limitations, I won't do this part, but I'll verbalize it. If you were to multiply this, open this up, and you were to open this up, and you do the multiplication, you do this with that, and that with that, you do this with that, and that, and you take care of all the signs that would arise, these negatives, what you'd end up seeing, everything here in the numerator would cancel out, you'll have zero over all of this squared, which I'll just write as F2 squared, and that will all equal to zero. The quotient of F1 and F2, by means of this quotient rule procedure, will zero out. What does this zeroing out tell you? That this expression or this item or this quantity over here, when you hit the derivative of it, gave you a zero, tells you that this item here must have been a constant. Think about it. A derivative of a variable goes down the template and you never zero it out. The only way you zero out item in terms of its derivative is that item was a constant. When you do a derivative of a constant, you always end up with a zero and you know that. If you do a derivative of x, you end up with one. But if you do a derivative of one, you end up with zero. So there's some item over here, a quotient that when you did the derivative of it, you got a zero. And that tells you, this procedure tells you that we're looking here at a constant. We have to determine what that constant is because determination of this constant will help us derive that formula we have over there. Now let's determine this constant and I'll show you how we do that. To determine this constant, you're still looking here at this form f1 or f2, right? The function one divided by function two and you put each of these items f1 divided by this. And we know that in terms of the derivative, all of this was equal to a zero. So what we're really looking at is this f1 or f2 in terms of zero, the zero being placed here into this expression and that becomes e to the power of i zero, right? divided by cosine zero plus i sine zero. It's no different than you evaluating a function in terms of zero. What's f1 divided by f2 zero is you putting zero in places of x. When you put that, what do you get? e to the power of zero is a one, cosine of a zero is a one, sine of a zero is a zero, and here you get a one over one, which is one. And this right here tells you a very important fact. The fact is this, that this quotient over here, which is made of this expression over here, is always equal to 1. We'll come down over here and we'll finish this out. e to the i x over cosine x plus i sine x is equal to 1. If you were to just cross multiply this across, what will you end up getting? You'll get e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine x and here it is the Euler's formula has been derived for you now remember in all of these instances of this entire derivation procedure this x could have easily been replaced with a theta and the theta would go through as the x did and your formula here would have theta instead of x so it would be the exact same procedure all of this has been derived for you using the calculus which depends here on the derivative procedure and a number of assumptions and that right there is a derivation procedure for this Euler's formula complete it for you. There are other ways of doing it, but this right here was the highlighted way for this video. And we can, in another video, look at some of the basic additional applications of the Euler's formula beyond what I showed you at the beginning of this. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned. Have a nice day.